this attack happens and he duct tapes her up, puts her in his truck, drives her 20, 25 minutes to the gravesite, picks her up out of the truck, puts her in this hole that's already dug, this crazy deep hole, and she is literally fighting for her life, suffocating as he buries her in the sand. Two children are without their parents tonight in Prescott. Their mother missing and their father the suspect in her disappearance. 39-year-old Sandra Pagniano. Pagniano's friends handing out flyers. The Prescott woman was missing. They gathered enough cell phone evidence that put him in the place Sandra Pagniano's body would ultimately be found. Evidence showed she was likely conscious for up to five minutes after she was buried. Welcome to Socialite Crime Club. I'd like to take some time today for you to tell me and our socialites and all of our trash talking trolls out there about the accuracy of cellular data. Yeah, I keep seeing a lot of comments about we don't have it right, they're not that accurate, it's junk science. And quite honestly, it's a lot more accurate than people think. I've spent the majority of my career educating law enforcement on this, but today I'm gonna change and I'm gonna educate our socialites on this. Today we're gonna talk about timing reports. Oh, this is a big deal. It is a big deal. It's a, it's a record. It's a record that the cell phone providers, the cell phone companies in the United States keep, all of them keep it. AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, they all have it. And they've all had it for some time now. Oh, yeah. And they all title it by a different name. So when you go to the providers and ask for this information as law enforcement, it's not called the same thing when you go to the providers. Correct. And it's been around for a while. And, you know, there's some challenges on how long they retain it. You have to be very specific in how you ask for it. So there are some challenges in law enforcement obtaining it. The big message here is they exist. They've been around for quite some time and it is possible to get your hands on these. Do you think it's worth telling our socialites the process of preserving that data? Depending on the different carrier, they have a shelf life of these records. So they don't keep them forever and you have to ask within a certain amount of time. And then depending on how soon you ask for them is how big of a data sample you can get. I'm not going to get too far in the weeds because we could talk for an hour on that alone. But I do want to talk about the technology. And the technology is based in science. Not signs, but science. Well, it's probably very scientific because the providers make a lot of money off of the science of timing and data and the accuracy and precision of where device is at. Right. When we're talking about timing, we're talking about the time it takes radio frequency to travel a said distance. And for those of you at home that aren't paying attention to this part, radio frequency travels at the speed of light. 186,000 miles per second. That's very fast. Yeah, if you want to quantify that in scientific terms, it's f***ing fast. <laughs> Take that. <laughs> yeah. So what this means is we can start to break down how long it takes radio frequency to travel and we can start estimating distances. So just as a rough point of reference, it takes 5.3 microseconds for radio frequency to travel a mile. A microsecond, by the way, it's one millionth of a second. And we have really sophisticated equipment that can actually measure time to this minute of a period. We can say, okay, this, this signal left this source at this time. It arrived at this source at this time. We know it took X microseconds to travel that distance. Mm -hmm. It's 3.6 miles away. It's right. 2.7 miles away. And it can actually be really accurate. So let's talk a little bit about what these reports provide. We get a date and a timestamp. So on this date at this time, this phone connected to this cell tower, this side of the cell tower, and this connection, because of that distance traveled, we know the phone was 0.6 miles away, or it was 2.3 miles away. And that's the timing piece of this. Because it's connecting to the side of a cell tower, we don't know where within this arc. And the way I explained this for years, imagine tying a string to the cell tower, and you're in an environment where you could pull that string out 1.5 miles, and then you just start walking. You create this arc, right? Mm -hmm. So we don't know where the phone is on that arc at 1.5 miles, but we know it's somewhere on that arc. And that's where we start to get a lot of this pie shape looking, this wedge look on a lot of mapping that's shown to juries or just shown generally to attorneys throughout the United States. Yeah, they're trying to represent the beam width, which is mm -hmm. that arc, if you will. Now, we only have one tower, one sector somewhere on that arc. 
However, we get a second tower in a second sector, those arcs are going to overlap. Mm -hmm. A third, a fourth tower, we can start to get very precise. I also think that it's important to notate that when you start to see that pie shape, that wedge, that beam width that we're just talking about that looks like a triangle, that's not necessarily what a radio frequency pattern looks like when it emanates from a sector or the side of a tower. Right, radio frequency travels all over the place. And I want to get away from what a coverage area looks like and talk just about timing right. because this changes everything. Now, a lot of people will be like, well, to triangulate something. And that's how I know when we started the episode with trash talking trolls. A lot of people like to talk about triangulation. It has nothing to do with what we're doing here. Right. Nothing. Well, I feel like the word triangulation is tossed out like, like chicken fodder, right? All the hens well, want a piece of it. Look at me. I'm smart. Yeah. I can say triangulation. wants to have an opinion on it because they think that they realize what it means and how to use it. And they always somehow put it out there in a, a very misinformative way. We're using trilateration, which is a very different concept. Mm -hmm. And I know my wife, when I say triangulation and trilateration, what are you going to say? Tell us the difference. Right. Okay. So I've got a diagram for you here. Let's talk about triangulation first. Notice the word angle. <laughs> is kind of buried in the middle of triangulation. That's because we have a given point, the red dot on the screen here, and we have an, a line of bearing. Sometimes they call these lobs, lines of bearing. So I know that that device is somewhere 42 degrees from that little red dot you see on the screen here. Triangulation is when I get a second dot and I know that the device is 280 degrees from that second dot. Where these two lines intersect, that's the third point. So I have the two fixed points, the two red dots on the screen, and then I get that third fixed point, which is this one here where they intersect. Now, for the sake of more understanding, when you see the third red point where they intersect, how far away could the device potentially be from that third dot? It's a great question because what if I'm a degree off? What if I'm two degrees off? What if I'm five degrees off and five miles off? So it depends on how far off that error rate is and how far away the device is. So if I add these cones in, so now I'm representing a plus minus of about three degrees, notice how much bigger that little area got. And if right. I get out to five or six miles, this could be a mile off. So it, it can get really challenging to be accurate with triangulation. And here's the bigger thing that nobody realizes. There is nothing in call detail records ever that gives us the information and the data we need to do triangulation. As soon as someone starts talking triangulation and call detail records, I know they're full of crap. And I think people need to realize that the degrees and the amount of space that could be traveled varies completely with each different environment that a crime occurs in. More importantly, we don't get the degrees. We will never know the angle that that phone interacted with a cell tower. It's not given in the data, which is why drive tests are so important. Correct. So let's move to trilateration. I have a given point here and I don't know where, as far as the angle goes, that the device is from that red dot. All I know is that the radio frequency timing tells me that device is 3.8 miles away from my cell tower. Could be anywhere on that red arc, right? I don't know where the device is. Mm -hmm. But then all of a sudden, I get a second connection. And the second connection tells me it's 5.2 miles away. Well, now I've got two intersections there and the phone could be on any one of those intersections where those circles overlap. But then I get a third one. And now I know exactly where that device is at. This is trilateration and it's so much more accurate than triangulation. What gets you on target so much faster? And the information I need to perform this calculation is included in the timing record. So this is actual data that we will get from the cell phone providers. Mm -hmm. And now I can go search this little blue dot. Now I'm doing this on a blank screen. Imagine now that I had 8,000 of these connections over the course of a day in roadways. On a map. People aren't traveling 80 miles an hour through fields. So especially when we get into rural areas and we look at timing, it's very easy to see where a phone is traveling, what road it's traveling, or what direction. Or school zone. It hangs a left hand at the light. Like you can start to see the accuracy of these things that you get here. These are not based on voice connections, text connections, or data connections. Me just having my phone on and in my back pocket, these little collections of data are happening throughout the day. Even if you turn the device on for a split second. Exactly. And we've had cases that we've actually seen this. If you remember Not My Valentine, 
that was timing data where he kills her and then he keeps her phone and the two phones start traveling together. That was timing data. It wasn't that they were just using the same tower. We could see the distant measurements from the tower were identical. And again, it's not GPS. Correct. I have worked with records where I've seen over 8,000 of these connections in a single day. And if you think of that spaced out throughout the day, that is a really true breadcrumb like trail of everywhere you're going. And then adding that on top of the text, data, voice, and GPS. Right. That's where things start to really take a turn when it comes to accuracy in an investigation. And I always hear this argument, yeah, but it's not true GPS. I need to address this for just a second because again, a lot of people don't realize what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of programs on your mobile phone that will generate some type of GPS data, but for different reasons, it will actually filter the amount of GPS data. And what I mean by that is how many points past the decimal point do we get? To get true GPS, we need seven digits past the decimal point. Seven digits past, we start getting three meter accuracy. If we're getting a Latin along, but we're only getting three digits past the decimal point, it could be off by 100 meters, 200 meters, depending on where you're at in the world. It's not as precise as people claim. I think we should talk a little bit more about why and how that starts to confuse people when they don't realize that you need all of the decimal, all of the digits after the decimal point for accuracy. I think the, the core problem here is people will see a latitude and a longitude and they'll think, oh, that's GPS. It's not. It's just a reference point. Most of the cell phone carriers provide some type of a lat long estimated location, but then they'll put an error of accuracy. And they'll say it's within 500 meters, 5,000 meters. I've seen reports where it says, here's the lat long. It's within 30,000 meters. Okay, it's somewhere in town. But people see the lat long and they think, oh, that's GPS. It's accurate. Right. It's not. Yes, we can get, and sometimes we're lucky enough to get, three meter accuracy GPS. But overwhelmingly, the records we get from the cell phone carriers, they don't include GPS. So this timing data is the most accurate. Well, you used to play a fun little game in class with people to have them drop a pin in Google Earth. And the pin would actually show a very specific latitude longitude with all of the digits. And then you'd have them remove two or three digits at the end of the lat long, and it completely changes the location of the pin. Yeah, if anybody wants to see this at home, just like you're explaining, go into Google Earth, you can drop a pin on the map. When you go to save that pin, it'll show you the lat long and it'll be seven digits past the decimal point. Save it so that you can see where it is. Go back in to edit that point and delete all but three of those digits past the decimal point and you'll actually see your pin move. And because we're dealing with poles, it's not consistent. That pin will move a little bit more or less in Florida than it will in Seattle compared to Kansas. So it's not a set distance that it moves either. It gets really complicated. But when people claim, oh, but it's not GPS, there's a lot of factors that go into the accuracy of GPS as well. So in short, we have this report, it's called the timing report. It is cell tower data and it's extremely accurate. And the people who say it's not that accurate, you guys don't know what you're talking about, they probably don't have any experience. But in our true socialite form, don't trust me, let me show you. Let's do it. So let's talk about David Pagniano, 55 years old. He is truly a terrible person. And by terrible person, I mean he is a complete piece of shit. You'll see where I'm going with this. Is this a booking photo or a driver's yeah, license photo? This is a booking photo. That's a red jumpsuit for jail. Okay. Red meaning you're the terrible guy in the, the cell block. Oh, usually they're orange. Yeah, he got red because he's such an ass. You get a special color. He used to work in oil fields when he was young. I don't think he finished school, if I remember right. I think he dropped out of maybe high school. Okay. Went to work in the oil fields, was doing a lot of drilling for oil. Mm -hmm. Some days, if I remember the story right, and I could have this slightly off, something breaks down in the oil well while they're drilling. Mm -hmm. And apparently that's really expensive because they lose this really expensive piece of equipment. He figured out how to rig something up where he could recover the equipment that broke off. Huh. Okay. Patented it, sold it, actually made quite a bit of money. Oh, good for so him. yeah, he has a, a pretty good life as a youngster doing this tool process of recovery from oil wells or whatever it is. He's going to get married young. He gets divorced. She took half. They always do. He gets married again, divorced again. She took the other half. They always do. So now he has nothing. 
Well, and then he gets married a third time. Oh, my gosh. And because he's such an ass clown, it doesn't go well either. So he is now going through his third divorce. And he's like, not this time. I'm tired of giving up half of my half of my half. Yeah. So he's looking for alternatives. And unfortunately, he goes the wrong path here. This is his wife, his third wife, Sandra Pagniano. Oh, she's pretty. Yeah, I think she's from Venezuela. Okay. Uh, they have two kids together. Uh, at the time, I want to say the kids are maybe 10 and 12 or 12 and 14. Okay. So that mid-range there. Uh, they are not happy. She is not happy. They are getting a divorce. They're separated, but they are still living together. So they're okay. living in the same house with their kids. And it's a nice house just outside of Prescott. Last week, we were talking yeah. about Prescott, another Prescott case. Yes. What is in the water up there? Yeah, there's definitely something going on. Sunday, May 21st, 2017, Sandra goes missing. David doesn't report her missing. A friend does. Oh, this is already off. We've seen this happen before. Which is kind of interesting because the cops show up at David's house and they're like, hey, buddy, where's your wife? And he's like, I don't know. She left. But hey, here's two notes that she left. One for the kids saying bye and the other one to me saying I get all of her stuff. It's been real nice and quiet <laughs> without her around. They do some handwriting comparison. He wrote both notes. Of um, okay. So right off the bat, the cops are like, yeah, not today, David. What did you do with your poor wife? <laughs> and now he's not talking. So she's reported missing on Sunday, May okay. 21st. May 25th. You probably don't remember this, but in 2017, you you and I were headed to San Bernardino to do some work with San Bernardino County on a drive test because they had a crazy arson fire that killed a bunch of people. In the Palm Springs area? We stayed in Palm Springs, but we actually were doing drive testing in San Bernardino. Yeah. And about the time we hit Palm Springs, I got a phone call from Yavapai County Sheriff's Office saying, hey, we've got this missing lady, doesn't look well, husband is super, super shady. We got the timing reports. What year was this? 2017? 2017. In 2017, we got the mm -hmm. timing reports. Yes. Can you take a look at these timing reports and let us know what you think? And the year is important to our socialites because it's 2017. It so Verizon is who this carrier was. Uh, very rural. They live north of Prescott, kind of out in the middle of nowhere. When I'm looking at the report, the majority of these connections are only off of one cell tower. The little demonstration I gave earlier, the more cell towers that are feeding in, the more accurate, right? Mm -hmm. In this one, we're only going to be able to work off of one cell tower. So okay. people probably think, oh, the accuracy is not there. It is. It's almost more accurate. Why is it more accurate? Super rural. It's, there's only so many ways you can get from point A to point B. And in rural areas, there are far fewer homes and houses. Yes. So when we see a phone traveling at 60 miles an hour, it's usually really easy to figure out what highway they're on. And then all of a sudden they start going east. It's really easy to figure out what road they're going east on. Mm -hmm. So although it's just one tower, we can still be really, really precise. I think it's also important to notate that not only can you see if somebody turned left or right or the road that they were traveling on, but also how long they were stopped. If they were to stop sign for a certain amount of time, a stoplight for a certain amount of time, you can see that with precise accuracy in the records. We have a case coming up in New York where this poor girl gets killed at a deli shop and they transport her body to dump her body. And we can see where the phone stops a number of times. In that case, we were able to go find video, and every time the phone stops, we have video explaining or showing why the phone stopped. We'll cover it in a couple months, but that one's a really good case to your point yeah. that yes, when you know what you're looking at, you can get extremely precise with these records. So in reviewing David's timing records, I'm looking at the time period, and at first I only got a little small snippet, and then they got me a much bigger snippet. When I'm looking at the bigger piece on 518, so what, we're three days before she goes missing, mm -hmm. about 942, he leaves his house. He drives out in the middle of the desert. He's out there for almost 90 minutes, and then he comes back. Got a little diagram here I want to show you. I'm going to put his house on the screen here, and we're going to zoom in. When I zoom in, you're going to see a red cell tower. It looks like a lollipop pop up, then a red line extending from that cell tower. That's the azimuth. That's the direction the antenna is facing. And then you see that red arc. That's the distance measurement that Verizon's giving us. So Verizon's saying, hey, this phone is whatever it is, 3.2 miles away from this tower. As I add a little time, notice we get another arc on the inside there. So now we have two arcs, one kind of by the house and then one closer to the cell tower. Mm -hmm. If we zoom in and we look at where David lives and we look at where that second arc, there's a highway that connects those two. For him to get from point A to point B in the time frame that we see, he's got to be on the highway. 
Then we see this little overlap right here. That tells me he's right in between those two sectors. He's switching antennas. Same tower, different sectors. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to see he starts to go out like this. He's traveling west. So we see the phone goes north and then it goes west. Well, you're seeing the, the sector overlays go out. But that's that timing distance. So right. if we start to look at, okay, what road could he have traveled on where we're seeing these arcs intersect with the different roads? And then eventually he gets to a point, just to your point earlier, he stops and he's there for 90 minutes. And I'm going to put the overlay, I put a little arrow on the screen here, and I'm going to populate that line back so you can see how accurate it is. That white arrow is where he went, and I'll get to how we know that here in a minute. So he's going to hang out there for a little while. I, I highlighted the route he took in purple, and then I'm going to play a whole bunch of time to show him going back home. Well, you can see all those hits just lingering there, too. He's there for almost 90 minutes. I think it was 78 minutes. And then we'll see a couple hits where he starts to head back in. And then here in a minute, when you see the sector change, that's because mm -hmm. he changed the highway. And you're going to see him actually heading back to the house. You can see that purple line kind of curves just a little bit, right? It's, right. it's a really sloppy upside down U. Sure. And again, when we talk about sector for our socialites, that means he's changing the side of the tower that he's using. He's switching antennas. So Correct. Those antennas are adjacent next to one another. Correct. So just looking at this one little bit of data on the 18th, I can get pretty close to the area. But you know, Dave's an overachiever. <laughs> He goes out there four times. So that was the first time. He's going to go out there three more times. Later that evening, he runs out there and right back. The exact same route, but as soon as he gets there this time, right back home. Mm -hmm. The next day on the 19th, he does it again. Runs out there, is there for a few minutes, comes back. Both of those times are late afternoon, early evening. Then on the 20th, just after midnight, he's going to go out there a third time. This time he's not coming back until a little after two o'clock in the morning. Oh my gosh. When I take all four of those trips and I stack them on top of each other, there is no doubt the route that he took and it's stopping at the same point every time. So we're sitting in the hotel in Palm Springs and I'm looking at this and I ended, literally dropped an icon on the map and I said, Hey, X marks the spot. You guys should go search here. I think you actually might've put like a little X. Or was it a pin? I, don't I put remember. a pin with a little yellow circle of my error rate saying, hey, here's the area, but I would search this whole area. And I said, if, if it was me, I would search here. Yes. So Yavapai County, and I've worked with them quite a bit. They're mm -hmm. like, good enough for us. <laughs> They're a great group of detectives. Yeah, we had a great relationship with them. And uh, so they send up their search and rescue team, and they're going to do a really good search up there. Now, the location I found, it's where a little side dirt road ends but it ends right next to a wash, an old wash bed that's dried up. Yeah, we should probably search the wash, right? Mm -hmm. They start walking this wash up the way, and one of the detectives actually notices under the tree that's kind of arching over this wash in the sand there. He's like, that's weird. It looks like somebody raked under this tree. So there were rake marks in the sand? In the middle of nowhere. They're probably... From Prescott, it's a solid 20 miles, probably a 45 minute drive. And no yeah, one's so raking they're, the sand in the desert. No, they're there. out in the middle and it's only under, you could see other areas where the rake marks got covered over, mm -hmm. but under this branch where the branch went over the sand, he didn't clean that area up and mm -hmm. he could actually see the rake marks and they're like, oh, this isn't good. No. So they start digging. Oh. They get down about 12, 18 inches. Mm -hmm. Nothing. Keep digging. And I've worked a lot of buried bodies, usually 20 inches, you're there. Mm -hmm. Nothing. 30 inches, <gasps> nothing. 40 inches, nothing. Did they have cadaver dogs by chance? They did. Dogs weren't hitting. They were about to quit. The only reason they continued is once they got down to about that 30 to 40 inch area, they started getting out of the soft sand and into that more compact, hard clay, clay sand. like dirt, yeah. And they started seeing the shape of a grave emerge <gasps> that somebody clearly had dug this up. So they kept at it. That is a very deep grave. It is incredibly deep. That's why he was out there so many times. Around 50 inches. Like you could pretty much stand in that hole. You're a little short thing. Probably. And you wouldn't even be able to see out. He was going to make sure this person never was found. He was never found. Or ever able to get out. Around 50 inches, they find her. 
they start to get a shoulder is the first thing that surfaced. Now, there's times where I spare our socialites some of the graphic details. Mm-hmm. Not going to do it this today. This one's so worth it. This is why this guy is a piece of shit. Yes. As they uncover her, she's duct taped. She's duct taped around her calves, around her thighs. Her arms are duct taped over her chest. So her arms are sealed to her chest. Like a cross position over right. her chest. Right. Her head, she's duct taped around her head, covering her mouth, but then also around this way. Around her jawline, over Correct. the top Keeping of her Keeping her mouth mean. shut. Her hand has worked its way out of the duct tape here and has worked its way up to her face and has pulled down part of the duct tape. So part of her... Her mouth. Her mouth is now exposed. At autopsy, they recover sand in her esophagus so and her lungs. breathing in sand. He buried her alive. She was alive when he put her in that hole. How long did they think she was alive for? At least five minutes from the time he started burying her. Oh my gosh. Now, keep in mind, it's about a 20-minute trip. He duct tapes her at the house. So sometime when she goes to bed, 11 o'clock, 1130, Mm -hmm. this attack happens. And he duct tapes her up, puts her in his truck, drives her 20, 25 minutes to the grave site, picks her up out of the truck, puts her in this hole that's already dug, this crazy deep hole, Mm -hmm. and then slowly, and he's a big fat guy. He ain't burying her fast. Yeah. And then he slowly starts. And he didn't her. just put her in there. I'm sure he dropped her into this very Correct. deep hole, which was already jarring to her. And she is literally fighting for her life, suffocating as he buries her in the sand. For people who are like, yeah, you guys don't know what you're talking about. That cell phone stuff isn't that accurate. Go screw yourself. <laughs> we found her. We put a pin on a map, dug a hole 50 inches deep, and found this lady based off of cell tower technology. So when you drop the pin on the map, how far away from the pin did they actually start digging for her? I was within, I think, 20 meters. 20 and meters. And for people who are very non-European and only do a football field, A football field is 100 meters. I would say the average field goal or the average, yeah, the average field goal is kicked about 20 to 30 meters out. Like if you cut a, a football field up into five pieces, equal pieces, it's one of those pieces. It's very close. It's very close. Very precise. It's close enough that they're like, uh, he said go here and we're seeing rake marks, we should dig a hole. That is how they find poor Sandra. Now, accuracy. When he drives back, we see the route. I'm not done with the investigation. Just because we found her doesn't mean we high five and think that we did a good job. Right. I carefully analyze, hey, just so you guys are tracking, he probably pulls in his driveway around 205-ish. A few minutes later, her car starts up and pulls into the garage from the driveway where they find it when she's reported missing. So not only does the cell tower data show us when he gets home, within a minute or so, he's moving her car into the garage. Almost to hide the idea that she's not there. We get one more lucky break. There's a video camera uh, to a, a gated community and there's a little guard shack up front. They've got a video camera that faces the highway where he would have passed. So we find that and we're like, hey, send me all the video from that camera for that week. And sure enough, every time we can see the phone moving from his house out there and we figure out the time frame, how long would it take him to get to this camera? There's his truck passing each and every single time. Including the night of the homicide. Including the night of the homicide. And I don't want to be 100% on just yet. Like, hey, give me a little bit more. They were able to find a point of purchase on one of those days, I think it was the 19th, where he ran into Prescott and they got a receipt at a store. I think he bought milk and maybe some eggs or something like that. And they used the timing data to show that as well. Well, no, they gave me the receipt and and I went back and sure enough, it goes right to the store. So we can show the same route at the same time. So we're able to show with all of these other cooperative pieces, just how accurate this is. And when I talk about this timing data, we've got a lot of cases we're going to be covering with these timing. This is one small example. I would say, how many bodies have we recovered at this point? I dozens? don't even know. At least dozens. Probably just shy of 50 mm-hmm. over the, the decades. Well, a lot of them over the past seven, eight years were literally people calling you in a panic and sending you data. And you would look at it over 10 minutes and just say, start here. And you were jumping to the next phone call. Jumping in the next phone call yeah. and then hopping a on a plane to go across the country for some really major thing. Not that any of those other missing bodies weren't major, but 
It was just such an everyday thing for you that I honestly couldn't count the number of times you've done it. We're going to cover a lot of these cases. We've got some more coming up after this where we're going to get into this timing data, but we have recovered bodies. We've recovered phones where somebody is a, a victim of a horrible crime. They're driving down a, a highway that whoever the suspect is, and they throw the phone out the window thinking they're getting rid of evidence. We have used timing data to say, Hey, that phone stopped on the highway right here. And by the way, it's on the north side of the highway. Search crews go out and they find the phone. Right. We've recovered evidence, weapons, guns, knives, all kinds of crazy stuff. So when I say, hey, this stuff is super accurate, it's not this one flash in a pan. Hey, here's one case. Dozens and dozens and dozens of cases over the years. And what's really interesting with this particular case is we taught this in all of our classes. So we've had thousands and thousands of law enforcement officers come through our classes and we would give them the records on the Pagliano case. And we would actually, we called it find the body. And we would teach them how to do these time distance measurements of looking at the, the sector information. And the goal in the class as a, a workshop is find where this phone is stopping each time at this, these four trips and put some type of a place mark on the map of where you would send a search team. And literally thousands and thousands of times we've had other officers find the same search area. Right. So it's repeatable. I think what's interesting too is that this case took so long before it was ever adjudicated that we use this, uh, this case in our 40 hour classes as a very good means of learning to interpret timing data for our students. But what was great about that was that they could take it back home well, to their agency immediately and start using it. So not only are we doing it as a business, as a company, day in, day out, they're doing it with other agencies around them day in, day out, the very high success rates. Oh, extremely high success rate. And to your point, it's interesting. In Arizona, the old wheels of justice turn really slow. Mm -hmm. 2017, this case was set to go to trial this summer. It was a death penalty case. David pled out last week. As when, in this summer, we would be in summer of 2024. 2024. And by the time our recording date goes, I've been waiting to do this case, but I've been waiting for it to adjudicate first. And he just took the plea deal last week, which was middle of May of mm -hmm. 2024. And basically he pled to life in prison without the possibility of parole in lieu of the death penalty. So that was the, uh, the, the piece of this, but that took seven years. So on complicated cases, when I hear people, why isn't this case already in trial? It's been a year. It can take two or three years very easily for some of these cases to, to go through the process. And other states are very fast, but Arizona, it is slow. Yeah, I would say three to four years on a complicated case is pretty average. Um, I would expect at least three to four years on, on the average case. Before trial began, though, he changes his plea. It was literally the week before trial. He's like, ah, you know what? Don't kill me. Just send me to prison forever. Mm -hmm. uh, so he's got the natural life sentence at this point. I wanted to share with our socialites what timing data is all about and the importance of timing data. We'll have a lot of other cases we're going to cover that we'll get in the weeds a little bit further. But Yeah, great case just to talk about the accuracy of it because I know that there have been a lot of questions out there, a lot of misinformation and a lot of misunderstanding that I feel we can do a lot to help with demystifying the idea of the accuracy of call detail records. Well, and I see a comment that, yeah, you and the FBI are screwed up. You guys don't know what you're talking about. And if I was to even reply that, okay, well, what about timing data? I'm sure that person would be like, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. So instead of commenting, we'll just have a little episode really quick. They know about triangulation though. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, next week. Join us next week, socialites, for aiming to please. I think the one thing that really, really disturbs me when I look back on a lot of these cases is the ability of a loved one or a lover or a spouse to look their spouse in the eyes and have a normal conversation knowing, I'm about to kill you. We get that you stabbed your husband. Why? You know, sometimes men just say stupid shit. Stupid shit.